Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear friends, uh, preceding speaker, my old friend, Dr. Uh, Satikul Bermar, has given you a very comprehensive picture of the ways in which climate change poses the most important threat to humanity today. Now, the point that I want to make, the first point I want to make, is that we, that is to say the countries of South Asia and Southeast Asia, live in the most vulnerable part of this planet. A recent uh, Asian Development Bank, Asian Development Bank study, shows that of the 10 most vulnerable countries of the world, no less than six are located in South and Southeast Asia. The countries listed by the ADB are Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Philippines, Afghanistan, and Myanmar in that order. Six out of the ten most vulnerable countries in the world. Why is this so? Why is it that our area, our region, is the most vulnerable part of this planet? There are two reasons. The first, of course, is geographical. Uh, the low-lying deltas of the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and the Indus rivers in Southeast Asia, and the Mekong and Irrawaddy rivers of Southeast Asia, are extremely vulnerable to sea level rise, low-lying uh, uh, low delta areas, together with the archipelagos and islands of Indonesia and Philippines and the high mountainous areas such as Nepal. According to the ADP study, one third of the population of Southeast Asia is at high risk on account of climate change. The fact is that despite the height about small island developing states, the majority of the people of this earth who will be the worst sufferers of climate change are the inhabitants of low lying empty regions, archipelagos, and high mountainous areas and coastal cities in poorer countries. Not all small island developing states are low lying. Many are not, and they're not really that susceptible to vulnerable to sea level rise. Several of the small island developing states are high income countries, some with per capita incomes of as much as $30,000 a year, or in excess of $30,000 a year, relating to cope with climate change. They are high income countries. The majority, the vast majority of the people of the South who will be affected by climate change, I repeat, are people living in continental areas and archipelagos, particularly in lowland temperate areas and high mountain areas. But apart from geography, there is another reason why they are the most vulnerable uh, countries. Climate change. And the second reason is poverty. We are vulnerable because we are poor. Because of poverty, we have negligible capacity to, de to cope even with normal seasonal changes, leave alone the devastating impacts of climate change. Every year, more than one and a half billion people living in South Asia send up prayers for a good monsoon. And when that arrives, when we have a good monsoon, you will find headlines on the front pages of our newspapers proclaiming the good news, but also tucked away in the inside papers, stories about thousands of villages that have been isolated by floods, about bridges and culverts that have been washed away, about flimsy huts that have been blown away by islands. 
by monsoon winds. So you see, our capacity to cope, even with a benign seasonal change, is minimal. And it is minimal because we are poor, because our infrastructure is flimsy. The only way in which we can build up a capacity to cope with climate change, to adapt to climate change, is through rapid and sustained development. And this is the main method that I want to put across here today. It is not simply a question of what we do with the ecology. It is a question of what we do with the economy. Sus achieving and sustaining a high rate of development must be an essential part of our response to climate change. Now, let me return to the ADB study. It shows that natural disasters in 2010 and 2011 drove out 42 million people from their homes in the Asia Pacific region. 42 million people. And here you understand what poverty means in terms of adaptation. So, what are the lessons uh, you know, that we have to learn from this? I repeat once again, unless we strengthen and climate to our physical infrastructure, dwellings, uh, bridges, roads, culverts, we will remain unable to cope either with climate change or natural disasters. Climate-proofing infrastructure requires huge inputs of finance and technology, and only rapid development can generate the required resources. You can call for international assistance. Believe me, you're going to get well, some money, but nothing, nothing approaching what is required. The most of the checks that will be offered are unsigned checks. We have to rely on ourselves and development is the only sure, sure solution for building up uh, coping capacity. Rapid development must be a central feature of climate change policy of a developing country. Now climate change does have a negative effect on growth rates, on development rates, as Dr. Atiko Brahman brought out in his introduction. But the fact is, the higher the rate of development, the lower the negative impact of climate change. The higher the rate of development, the lower the impact of climate change, because our coping capacity increases with development, as a result of development. So what can we do to promote regional cooperation in coping with this common threat, this common danger? And I would say there are three dimensions to regional cooperation. The first is joint studies and information exchange. Now, ecological zones cut across national boundaries. Climate change is going to affect Bangladesh, and West Bengal, Assam, and uh, other uh, you know, Indian states, Orissa, etc., in much the same ways. Because we lie in, uh, in, in, a, in a common ecological zone, it straddles across natural boundaries. And therefore, studies relating to the detailed impacts of climate change, what we can expect in the future, uh, these studies will be of interest, I think, to our neighbor. Uh, all of our countries are doing a great deal to try and anticipate what the impacts of climate change will be. For example, changes in monsoon patterns, and these, I think, will be of common interest to our, uh, to our neighbors as well. The second type of cooperation is an exchange of experience uh, sharing of our experiences on coping strategies. Uh, as 
Dr. Rahman pointed out that uh, each of our countries has drawn up its own climate change strategies, including in particular adaptation strategies. What can we learn from each other's experience in this? After all, as I said earlier, ecological zones travel across natural boundaries. So therefore, I think it's very important that we learn from each other's experience, what are successful experiments, what are less successful experiments, how do we proceed further? And the third point, the last but not at all the least important, in fact in many ways the most important, is mutually beneficial economic cooperation to speed up our development. Building up mutual economic cooperation is not only good for our economies, it is good for our climate change strategies. And it should be seen as an integral part of our climate change strategies and not merely our economic strategies. Economic cooperation to accelerate development should be an essential part of our climate change policies. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.